more about this data sheet on this LM555 tonight. And as you see, I've pulled up the same data sheet that I had last time. And we're going to go a little bit through a little bit more on this thing. Okay, first I'm going to go back and visit this block diagram. And uh, one thing I want to point out, the discharge one here, discharge pin, when it starts to discharge in that capacitor, all of the current has to go through this transistor right here. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that this control voltage, which is connected up here to VCC times two-thirds, um, that is very important because that controls what the threshold is being compared to. And you'll see why I'm bringing these up at this point. Okay, we're going to go down here to the uh, monostable circuit again. You see this time I blew it up a little more, so it should be a little bit easier for all of us to read. Okay, that discharge circuit on this one is connected to the threshold point, which remember I said is compared to the uh, control voltage. Okay, first thing I want to point out is that you can't let the capacitor get too awful big because if you do, all of that has to be discharged through the uh, discharge uh, transistor and it could probably only handle so much. So that's why you see the capacitor can go from anywhere from, I think that is microfarads, okay, and it's 10 to the minus 3 up to, to 100 microfarads. That's the biggest one it can handle. And uh, that limits, that's one of the things that limits the amount of time that this thing can have, the maximum time. The other thing that limits the maximum amount of time is this resistor right in here. If you think about that transistor, although it tries to turn off, it never does, nothing ever does completely turn off. There is some leakage through it. So if this, if this uh, resistor gets too big, uh, it's going to get swamped out by that amount of leakage that's going in there. So it's never really truly going to discharge. So there's a limit. And if you remember right, time constant is resistance in ohms times capacitance in farads. So microfarads and mega ohms cancel out. Uh, so it's capacitance of microfarads times resistance in mega ohms. And uh, there's a, that's the time constant. Time constant is the amount of time it takes to reach approximately 63% of the uh, voltage. And that would be the 63% of ECC. Well, remember this thing, the threshold is at, at uh, two-thirds, which would be 67%. So, you know, a time constant is a rough estimate for how long it's going to take for this thing to... Uh, to charge for the monostable operation. Remember I said rough estimate. We can get better than that. But, uh, and then we can use this chart right in here to, to get a little more accurate. If you really want to get the time constant down, because the capacitor has, has a, a pretty good tolerance. I think they're usually around plus or minus 10%, but you can probably buy them more accurate. Resistors now have a tolerance of 1%. It's pretty common. 2% is real common. But if you really wanted to be super accurate, you'd, you'd calculate it and then put a potentiometer in there and adjust it to get the exact time you wanted. Uh, we're not going to, well, we don't go that amount of trouble in the uh, desulfator that I'm building. The uh, designer didn't go to that much trouble. But yeah, if you really want to need a time that you really want it right down, that would be the way to go. Okay, remember I talked about that control voltage, and I said it was tied into that resistor that's the same one that the threshold compares. Okay, what's going to happen is when this, when the flip-flop flips and flops, uh, there's going to be current transients going in here. All of a sudden, thing that was all nice and happy at drawing the amount of current it was drawing, it's going to change really fast because some of the transistors turn off and others turn on. And when that happens, more than likely, you're going to have a drop through some of these circuits in here on this VCC, and you're going to have a drop 
Well, you're going to have a drop at VCC as it's coming in. And a drop through that uh, that resistor at the, at the two-thirds point. So what control, the, or yeah, control this, res, this capacitor right in here acts like a spring holding the uh, voltage constant when all that happens. So that's the only purpose for C2 is it's a decoupling capacitor, which if that word, I'll put that word in a, um, we talked about it earlier, a long time ago in one of my blog posts, and I'll put a link to it uh, here to get you back up to speed on what a decoupling capacitor is. This is not exactly the place where it's normally put, but it's a good place to have one on this, this circuit. Okay, let's look a little bit more detail at this waveform down here. You see when the trigger happens, it brings the output high, and it causes this this uh, discharge capacitor or transistor to turn off and C starts to charge up the voltage across C does which is the same thing as what the threshold voltage is once it reaches two-thirds of VCC it causes that voltage comparator there to toggle the flip-flop and the output changes very quickly but if you notice it takes a little bit of time for the discharge to happen and they, they drew that with a slanted line right here to show you it takes a little bit of time. Point being, remember it's going through a, a transistor there, so it takes a little bit of time for it to happen. There's a little bit of, res little bit of resistance through that, re that transistor. It's going to get real important as we start talking about the A-stable operation. So we're going to talk about that right now. <laughs> And uh, okay, and that's where we're at. A stable circuit. And they, whoever labeled that kind of blew my mind right there. Should be one, no space between those. Okay, on the A stable circuit, you notice that the threshold is connected to the trigger. Remember, the trigger can't connect triggers at one-third and it triggers on a low and the threshold triggers at a high at two-thirds of the VCC. The only other difference in this circuit is that what used to be RA is now tied together and becomes RB and the discharge and the threshold between those two uh, is the RB part. So on charge up time as this thing charges when the threshold when the discharge turns off, it's going to charge through RA plus RB to make that charge time. When it discharges, it's going to have to discharge this capacitor through RB uh, to discharge it, plus whatever the resistance is of that, of that uh, transistor. So you see this one here, when it, it, it triggers itself once it reaches a, uh, it drops down to certain voltage, then it hits the trigger point, then it starts charging again. So it's charging back and forth from one-third to two-thirds voltage. It flip-flops back and forth. And uh, again, we have our capacitor across the control one. We haven't dealt with RL yet, but we will eventually. Okay. So this shows it. You see it's charging up, and then once it triggers, it takes a little bit of time to discharge. It gets back to one-third of VCC, and they don't tell you that here, but that's where it does. They do in the words. And then it goes back, and it charges back up to two-thirds VCC. I think I said one-third right there. Two-thirds VCC, and then it discharges. Okay, they got a nice little graph up here to kind of give you approximates of how much capacitance and how much resistance and what the frequency is that it's going to do in Hertz. And, uh, and that's kind of interesting here. I think maybe this chart, and this is R1 plus R2. Uh, Yeah, okay, you see bigger capacitors, 
Yeah. Uh, uh, it's not exactly making sense right here. Yeah, it is. Uh, I'm not sure I'm buying this right now. And I will write it in the text, the notes, what was bothering me here. Anyhow, they give you this nice little graph. They also provide it to you in formula. And you see that right in here, they're talking about RA plus RB for, for, for C to calculate the, the uh, turn on voltage, the voltage before it reaches a threshold. And this formula right in here would work the same for uh, the time to reach threshold would be the same if you just take RA plus RB and replace that with RA in the previous circuit. And uh, this will give you the, the time and what the ideal values are. Okay, now when it starts discharging, this is when it goes through RB and it goes through that resistor, I'm sorry, that transistor, and that's they show is that equal to RD. And they go through some math here and tell you how long it would take for it to go low. And then they go through some math if you wanted to have a 50% 50 50 uh, cycle. In other words, the same amount of time to charge up as it does to discharge. And they give you a number there that it would take to do that. And uh, you can go through all that on your own. But if you've read about capacitors and you read the stuff that I said about the uh, exponential curve, which is what this is right here, the formula. Uh, that will give you where these voltages are being reached right here. It starts out in the case of discharge only at two-thirds of VCC. Again, even though it's a really nice formula, it looks like it's got a lot of really good numbers. It's got third decimal point here and the whole deal. The problem with that is that you will see as we go into the, uh, to the numbers up here. Okay, that's it on that circuit. Let's go to this frequency divider. Frequency divider basically is just the monostable one, the first circuit that we dealt with. And the triggers are happening more often than what the uh, what we've set the timer to be. But they're not close enough that they're getting to the very edge here, which is, remember, in that one circuit was called the uh, abnormal operation. So you can divide it so that you get one-third the frequency going out in this example that they do here. You could probably go up to four or five, but if you started getting to the point where this was getting too close to the point where it's getting ready to trigger, uh, you'd have those false triggers that we showed in the uh, abnormal one, which let's go back up there to that. Yeah, right here. You see that they're happening too close, and it's causing that. Plus, the width is is uh, pretty wide there on the negative side of those. So, you know, it can only go up to a certain point. And everything's like that. You can only take things so far, and then you're done screwed up. Uh, we're not going to deal with these other two here, at least not right now. Um, and there's reasons... Uh, I deal with them at all to be on the very next video. And I'm at 13 minutes. We're going to see if we can make it through this last part. Okay, we're going to go through some of this. Okay, you see that the supply voltage on this particular brand can go from 4.5 to 16. I looked at, did a quick look at Texas Instruments data sheet. It said some different values, I think 5 to 15, but I'm not sure if those were maximum and minimum. This gives you what the supply current is, but notice that RL is at infinity. In other words, it's open. So this is just the supply current for this thing only. If it's supply and a load, it's going to take a little bit of more. A little bit more current because you're going to have to add what the load's taken. Okay, it talks about the timing error, and that's the percent change for... Um, initial accuracy and that's why I think if you're calculating it but that number really doesn't make a lot of sense although they have a note down here okay test with VCC at 5 votes and VCC at 15 I think we can explain that right here difference with temperature uh, as the temperature increases 
uh, in degrees centigrade, you can expect 50 parts per million changing in the uh, per degree, which ain't much. Drift with supply voltage. Okay, you've got a percent there, and that's kind of a pretty good little number right there, 0.1 percent. Although you know volts are not going to change that much. If you imagine you're at five volts, hopefully you wouldn't change from five to six or some big number like that. But if you go from five to five to uh, 15, uh, that's a three times increase, and that explains part of this number up here going from. 5 to 15. Okay. Timing error, and this goes into more. Timing error on the uh, A stable one, it gives you a percentage there. All those are pretty easy to understand. The control voltage, it tells you what that should be. Remember, we said that should be two thirds. Two thirds of 15 is 10, but it could go as high as 11, could go down to 9. Again, depending upon the individual chip, that would mess up the calculations that we were doing earlier with those big long formulas, which means if it's real important to get the frequency you want, you're going to have to use a pot potentiometer, uh, short term as pot. No, I'm not smoking any. <laughs> I'm sorry, bad joke. Uh, threshold voltage, uh, we got that. And that one they say is really good, and I'm surprised that they can say that, but they do. Especially when the uh, trigger voltage is, um, well, this this number up in here can be so far off, yet this vote number says it'll be right on. I, I don't understand that. Uh, okay. Trigger voltage, they got some, some numbers here, which that one should be one-third. And uh, you see that 0.6. 167 is, I believe, one third of five. And at 15, it's at one third. It's what it's centered on, but you see there is some numbers there it can be around. This tells you how much the trigger current is, which that's the feedback on the, uh, on the A stable. And it's an input on the uh, mono stable. It's not much, microamps. Uh, it's not much, and, but it's a number. So if resistances get really big, it could matter. Reset current and reset voltage. Anything below, anything from 0.4 to 1 is in no man's land. It's the way most people would consider that. Zero is what you want for reset. And it's going to take this kind of milliamps through it. So you couldn't have a resistor being pulled down to a point you'd have to look at what that resistor is if you're using electronics to pull it down to reset. So you notice we've been letting it float in all these circuits. Uh, okay, output output voltage. When an output go voltage is at a it's not much. In other words, it's gonna pull it down pretty daggone good at 10 milliamps and 50 milliamps. Um, and even when you're at 5 volts is pulling it down, but even at 15, which is higher. Okay, output voltage high gets up to 12.5. It doesn't go all the way up to 15 at 15 volts. And that's with it drawing 200 milliamps. So um, that's quite a bit of amps going out. Actually, it's yeah, quite a bit. As you see, it starts loading it down compared to 100 milliamps to 200. Okay, the rise time of an output is in nanoseconds. It's 0.1 microseconds. And same thing with the fall time output. So that's why they drew those curves happening really fast on the square wave on the output. And the discharge leakage current, remember that's the one we worried about. Uh, how much it would leak while it's being turned off. Uh, and that's going to try to charge that capacitor just a little bit. Not much, but just a little bit. So that's the one that affects the time calculation on the um, on the asynchronous. Anyhow, I think we've pretty much went through almost almost all of this. I may come back and do those last two circuits sometime. Uh, I'll have to think if we're really prepared for it and what I've presented in the blog so far. But 
this pretty much takes care of all of uh, all of this data sheet for what we need to know for the desulfator. And uh, the desulfator, by the way, is using this circuit, the asynchronous circuit. And we'll talk about that probably in the blog. Uh, but that's basically the, uh, I'm sorry, the A-stable operation. And uh, that's the one that flip-flops back and forth. And that's what the uh, desulfator uses right there. And you can pretty much see it in their circuit if you look at it now. Appreciate you listening. Hopefully you got something out of this. This is Gary Fox of Crate and Lake. You have a good one.